paper arises from a research I just began, as Fabio said, which is exploring prehistoric skyscapes. And my PhD is entitled A Diachronic Study of Monumentality and Cosmology in Mid Holocene, South, Southern England and Wales. And it addresses this session's theme of visualizing skyscapes in as much as I'll be looking at the sites and monuments in this region's ancient landscapes in terms of their connection to the celestial sphere. And really what I'm doing now is asking, do I have work to do for the next six years? Do we have skyscapes in this region? So today's presentation is a preliminary sketch of sites chosen because they span the mid-Holocene. They're not a definitive record. My methodology is restricted to literature review only. Subsequent field work will be guided by this preparatory exploration. Some of the sites chosen here have been surveyed by others, whilst in some cases I've measured excavators' diagrams, so findings can only be considered a very rough guide. Fabio Silva suggests that when we judge a skyscape, we integrate archaeoastronomic data with the archaeological narrative, also that we retain a phenomenological approach and that we look for pattern recognition at local scales. And this is what this paper is going to try to do. Turning first to the archaeological narrative, as Rick Schulting points out, there's what he dubs a paucity of dates from good terminal Mesolithic contexts in this area. Timothy Darville has also noted, little can be said about either the technological or cultural relationships of the 7th to 5th millennium BC material record around Stonehenge in particular, he's talking about, as there's simply not enough of it to judge. Rosamond Keel points out that although the region was used from the early post-glacial period to the late Neolithic, our knowledge of those times is pitifully sparse. Recent excavations, as we know at Stonehenge, have changed this. Of particular interest is the excavation at Blick Mead, a mile and a half east from the Stone Circle. Excavated by a team led by David Jacques, the site contains burnt flints, tools, and critically, the remains of auroch found within the diet of Mesolithic hunter-gatherers. Eighteen radiocarbon dates have recently been released by the excavators, proving the site was in continuous occupation between 7,500 to 4,000 BC. Mesolithic Blick Mead, Jacques contends, connects the early hunter-gatherer groups returning to Britain after the Ice Age to the Stonehenge era. He claims that this is the oldest continuously occupied settlement in Britain. Up until 2006, only about 30 worked flints from the Mesolithic period had been found in this area. But the Blickmead excavation, which started in 2013, has found 35,000 Mesolithic tools and worked flints concentrated into a very small area of about 36 square metres. This, they say, makes Blickmead atypical. Most previous settlements found in Wiltshire have produced, as we just heard, small numbers of finds of limited variety, often interpreted as single task specific, such as hunting camps. Being reminded by Silva that the phenomenology of a site adds context, in the case of Blick Mead, its material record demonstrates that as well as being a centre of intensive flint working, a complex variety of other activities was being pursued in an unusually concentrated way. Jacques suggests Blick Mead was a home base or residential site where people either lived for longer periods or returned to repeatedly to conduct a range of activities. This suggests a complex community was in place, but whoever they were, Jacques says they knew and utilised the landscape for a long time before the later stone circle went up. On that landscape, just over a mile away, very close to where the subsequent stone circle was built, we have the earliest Mesolithic structures found in Britain in the form of the Mesolithic post holes, which, as we know, were under the old Stonehenge car park. Blickmead's dates and those of the Mesolithic <coughs> post holes indicate contemporaneity. Talking of the post holes, Mike Parker Pearson says that, quotes, despite 50 years of large-scale excavations across Western Europe, the Stonehenge posts are unrivaled in Mesol as Mesolithic monuments. He goes on to say they date to the earliest stages of Blick Mead, and he also says it's likely that the people gathering there were responsible for putting the posts up. 
When considering the pattern the posts create, Roy Loveday describes it as possibly being etched into a long, enduring mental template. He suggests their relatively even spacing, coupled with the comparable space left between the westernmost example and an isolated tree pit, points to purpose, as he calls it, and integrity, or as we argue astronomers or skyscapers say, to intent. Loveday surveyed the posts as orienting to 91 degrees of azimuth, as I have, particularly post A to B, which are the radiocarbon dated ones. With horizon altitude factored in, that delivers zero degrees of declination. And this possibly indicates an orientation to either the equinox or, given Fabio Silva's research, the rising or setting autumn full moon eclipse at minus standstill. If the posts were intentionally aligned, we have the possibility of a skyscape emerging at the oldest Mesolithic site in Britain, engineered by an atypical large-scale community of some complexity. Clive Ruggles cautions that should alignments be thought to exist, we must ask what use people made of those connections to the sky. Where Blick Mead is concerned, David Jacques suggests the posts were used by its hunters to mark the shallow dip the posts lie in, through which wild cattle were channeled at a safe distance from home. Thus, the archaeological narrative begins to add to the profile of the community who possibly engaged with the post hole skyscape. Engaging even further with that narrative, an interesting find at Neolithic Durrington Well Walls close by was evidence of cattle which had travelled great distances on the hoof from as far as Mid Wales, Gloucestershire or Cornwall. However, similar long distance links seem to have occurred well over 2,000 millennia earlier <coughs> at Blake Mead. David Jacques, who views the appearance of a dog as a proxy for people, reports finding a dog tooth in a, const in a context dated to the start of the fifth millennium. The dog's oxygen isotope shows it came from northeast England, possibly the York area. When geographical links such as this appear, it speaks of trade and exchange, of ideas as well as material goods. So if those at Mesolithic Blick Mead were implicated in establishing a skyscape, this might have been something discussed, shared, or contended by those further afield. My next site reveals a possible replication of orientation by two different communities, the first Mesolithic, the second Neolithic. This occurred at Ascot under Witchwood, which shows evidence of Mesolithic hunter-gatherer activity and also Neolithic ritual architecture in the form of a megalithic burial mound. These are the radiocarbon dates. The Ascot, Earthen and Stone burial mound oriented northeast, southwest, at plus nine, minus eight degrees of declination, which Silver again notes is another rise point of the eclipsing autumn full moon at minor lunar standstill. However, Mesolithic post holes were found beneath the footprint of the stone tomb, with one of the Ascot archaeologists, Leslie McFadden, being particularly struck by the row of Mesolithic post holes which made up timber structure one. She noticed how the later stake holes which the barrow builders used to create the axial alignment of the subsequent stone Neolithic mound oriented rather uncannily in the same direction as the post holes in timber structure one. So, this is the surface of the pre-barrow. The uncanny rep replication was between these post holes inserted in the Mesolithic and the later Neolithic stake holes. This is an outline showing the footprint of the <coughs> Neolithic barrow. These stake holes were inserted to establish that subsequent barrow's primary axial orientation. If the Mesolithic pre-barrow post holes and the subsequent mound were both deliberately oriented, this shows evidence of a continuity in celestial target across eras. The Neolithic barrow and the Mesolithic post holes accessed the same point on the horizon. A turf line divided these two episodes, so this location had fallen out of usage between the Mesolithic and the Neolithic, but the orientation was repeated, if intended, by those who brought megalithic technology onto this landscape. This repeated pattern indicates possible continuity. 
I wanted to look at the Lambourne Long Barrow because, similar to Ascot, it was built very, very early on in, and, uh, as, as the megaliths began to appear, 3,760 to 3,654 Cal BC. And it's, that's one of the earliest dates of a megalithic monument in this part of Britain. And it may give clues about the cosmological practices of the people, the new colonizers who were incoming at that time. These new builders in stone gave indication, as Rick Shorting points out, of the arrival of the earliest Neolithic on this landscape. Certainly, these monuments are a radical step change in the material record. Chris Scar argues they're not just a crude manipulation of materials, an early form of unsophisticated architecture. Megalithic monuments, he says, incorporate ideas about the world. Ian Hodder references their symbolic function, saying it's possible that the technical processes involved in their build and design may be linked in important ways to structures of meaning. In the Lambourne Barrows case, if that meaning was informed by an attachment to the sky, though the mound hasn't been surveyed and the diagram's directions cannot be assumed exact, a protractor gives a rough azimuth of 73 degrees. The landscape around this barrow is low, slow-rising hills, so depending on the horizon altitude, that which would be low, that could indicate a symbolic orientation, possibly to the area of the sky where the northern motion in the standstill occurs. Referencing Chris Scar's phrase, ideas about the world, it is perhaps possible the people who built this barrow had ritual and calendrical, pract calendrical practices tied into longer cycles than those who built the Ascot under Witchwood Barrow with its possible celestial attachment to annual autumn horizon events. Glyn Daniel estimates that there are between 1,500 and 2,000 megalithic tombs in the British Isles, and they obviously access all horizons. Martin Powell has done a most useful survey of 14 chambered long cairns, all of the same type in the Gower, so this fulfills Silver's small scale um, sample structure that we looked at. This is a list of the azimuths, and I'm just going to be looking at the, the black ones because either symbolically or through their declinations, they access the solar arc, the solar and lunar arc that where the sun and moon rise on the horizon. And Powell has assumed that the entrances of the tombs presented the focal point of the structure. And what he noticed was that none of the monuments faced the western horizon. This absence may reflect a cosmology to do with the way a setting sun, moon, or star differs symbolically from a rising one. We can note that within the solar lunar maxima I just described, more of, these, more of those orientations, which you can see just here, are towards the minus declinations, that is, south of east. So it's possible that those who built the tombs orienting to those, those points valued ritual or secular focus during the spring months. These monuments appeared on the landscape suddenly, Rich Shorting arguing that the appearance of this radical new architecture is evidence of a rapid neolithicization in this region, which speed of change has implications for understanding the impact these possibly new skyscape practices might have had on the indigenous cultures, or not. Turning now to the new mortuary practices that were emerged at the beginning of the Bronze Age, which included interments of individuals and wealthier grave goods, in this sample, I've chosen to access the orientation of skeletons. Joanna Brook argues that it's clear that human remains were used in situations where concepts of liminality, identity, continuity, and renewal needed to be highlighted. And the question now is, do these skeletons make up any part of a skyscape narrative? The following six interments were chosen because they represent a range of dates across the Bronze Age. There's the Amesbury Archer from near Stonehenge, dubbed the King of Stonehenge <coughs> because of the rich grave goods in his grave. He was a migrant from the continent with a childhood spent in a geographical zone as far to the east as Scandinavia or Germany. As we can see, the body lies west, northwest, east, southeast. The skeleton 25004 in the Boscombe Bowman's grave, found near the Amesbury Archer, was also non local, originating from either northern Britain or Southeast Ireland or the continent. This skeleton replicated the Amesbury Archer's direction west, northwest, east, southeast. Just south of Amesbury is West Overton, 
A long, oblong grave was found, cut into the chalk beneath a large <coughs> mound. We can only rely on the, on the text of the antiquarians who found the skeleton, who was an elderly male, and they tell us he was reportedly lying with his head to the east. At Hempnol, also near Avebury, there's the head and hooves burial, so-called because of the grave goods included. The excavators write that the long axis of the grave had a north-west-south-east <coughs> orientation. The Bush Barrow series is found on the Normanton Ridge overlooking Stonehenge. This is a hypothetical reconstruction based on an excavator's account. The skull orients southward. At Barrows Hill Grave in Oxfordshire, the head orients north. So, in this small sample of six, for at least 800 years between 2470 Cal BC to 1689 Cal BC, three of the dead were buried, facing a si favoring a single axis to the horizon, which was west, northwest, east, southeast all of them with their head orienting to the west. Taking the other three graves into account, maybe that at around 2020 Cal BC, a new ritual emerges where some people seem to orient their dead towards the cardinal points, due east, due north, and due south. The unifying features of this last set of three is the cardinality, which, if it is an intended skyscape ritual, started later than the first. In conclusion, this preliminary sketch of the skyscapes of mid-Holocene Western Britain drew on a small sample of sites and monument types across a period of long durée. It applied silver stricture that when testing for skyscape engagement, one should integrate archaeoastronomic data with the archaeological narrative. And this was done at Mesolithic Blickmead, where new radiocarbon dates of flint work indicate an atypically complex community inhabited the landscape when the Mesolithic posts were installed. Turning to the next idea that a phenomenological approach to the landscape be applied, the excavators at Blickmead suggest the Mesolithic posts may have been used for sight lines for hunting purposes. Certainly, posts A and B were oriented to the equinox, indicating that if those who lived at Blickmead put them up, they must have valued marking the arrival of spring and autumn by the sun and possibly the full moon. Silver points to the value of pattern recognition at small scales, and a pattern was found at Ascot on Witchwood, where two different communities from two different eras, one from the Mesolithic and another from the Neolithic, created a possible alignment to the same celestial target, the rising eclipse and eclipsing autumn full moon at minor lunar standstill. Another type of skyscape pattern was found amongst the group of stone monuments on the Gower where it's possible, given the similarity of their architectural design, <coughs> sedenting colonisers from a single culture predominantly oriented their structures to the spring sunrise or spring full moon. Given their avoidance of the western horizon altogether, it's possible that cosmologies do, to do with rising as opposed to setting celestial objects applied at this time. Patterns existed in the Bronze Age too, with an even distribution in my small sample between, on the one hand, orientation to cardinal directions as opposed to those communities who displayed fidelity to a single axis. Taking the Lambourne Barrow, as I did, in isolation may prove the point that findings from a single site are not persuasive. It would be interesting if Lambourne did orient to the moon's longest cycle. But, as Gerald Hawkins wrote, it's more difficult to establish credibility for an isolated alignment than for a pattern. What might speak of an engagement with the sky is, as Silver points out, repeated orientation to the same horizon in small-scale examples, the findings further amplified by information from a wide appreciation of both the archaeological record and a phenomenological assessment of the environment. Certainly, as found in the small samples mentioned in this paper, patterns of possible alignment did exist in mid-Holocene southwestern Britain, which give indication that further research is warranted. Thank you.